Very happy to have you back to this our show, Human Humane Architecture on ThinkTech Hawaii. This is our 269th show. And since last week, we don't know anymore which accumulated viewer number you are, but we luckily know someone who knows that, and that's the one who runs us, our producer, Eric. Let us know, Eric. Hey, Martin. Uh, we currently have 14,500 views, totaling up to over 1,000 viewing hours on YouTube. All right. Thanks, Eric. And not that numbers matter as much for us as, as they matter in these moments as we speak in the United States of America. We're still counting some ballots for the midterms. And um, we are back here as the Die uh, Drei Glatzköpfe von der Tankstelle, which means this is your weekly German lesson, De Soto. You figured. You already said it. So it's the three bald guys from the gas station. Oh, the three bald guys from the gas so station. So besides me, Martin Despang, and the Waikiki Grand, it's you, DeSoto Brown, in your Bishop Museum. Unfortunately, not back in your easy breezy Ossipov childhood. And you met Noblet back in your office in Boston, Massachusetts. Good to have you guys back on board. So... Let's cover a little bit what's going on here. Again, we are all electing our governors, or most of us. Um, how is that going for you, Matt? Can you briefly give us an update? Uh, Mara Healy was successful last night, I, which I think uh, we're all very happy about. So um, good news on the from the East Coast. <laughs> Indeed. And similar here, if we put it even in here, we have Mr. Green uh, uh, as a new governor starting in uh, December. Not that it was a great surprise, but as you said, the Soto is still good to know and still it good to be confirmed. Yes. And when I was walking, I mean, obviously that's a name that everyone, ex us including, will use, abuse for making cross references. The star advertiser are journalist um, professionals. When I was out on my to my run this morning, I see it laying on the floor, delivered to some neighbor, and it basically said green light. Ha uh ha. -huh. And we obviously want to see a lot of green in the green here, because in the in the red states that were my uh, stepstones, I have to say, you know, ashamed, uh, both in the prairie and in the desert, where the cities I taught in, I coached, were the capitals and therefore the intellectuals, and therefore they were like blue islands in the red seas of these states and in arizona it's still going on and let's not go there let's stay here uh but um again um there's one thing that josh green has been you know a part of his campaigning was um actually something that has to do with us a lot uh it is uh, affordable housing and even more specifically some who are the most in need which is homelessness a little ironic, DeSoto, uh, we had four bills to supposedly pass and vote on four amendments. The one that looks like it didn't make it uh, is actually the affordable housing one. So go figure that, right? We are starting out with a stretch with uh, hiring or you know appointing a governor who says, I want to do that. And then we, the people, don't have the majority for that. How odd is that, right? That's the way elections go. That is just all you can say. I guess so. So as we started and dragged you, Matt, into uh, always starting out looking at the proposed beauties on the island here, <laughs> which are the ones to come. So there's a new one here. And I know you guys will say, don't judge a book by the cover. That is very fair. And we know I'm going to be the one to say, well, how much more do we need to know to judge this? <laughs> So uh, this is, uh, DeSoto, you want to brief us where that will be? Actually, this one, I am not 100% sure where this is. Right. I've looked at this I picture and, out. Under, okay. Under the green, under the green name, yeah. is, a green, is a green space. And green that's space. A, that's a park and that's Mother Waldron's park. Oh, yes, so that's right. right. Next to that, right? Yes, and this is, I have been, I've been trying to figure out exactly where this is going to be. I think this is where Fisher is. Yeah, I'm pretty yeah. sure it's the small building where Fisher Hawaii is. And then the park will be to the right. <laughs> um, this is an area that's growing a lot. This is an area that is currently gentrifying and getting high rises put into it. It's also somewhat hip 
in how it's been developed because the salt at Kaka'ako shopping area is across the street from this or very near this. So it's not 100% a surprise, but at the same time, it is going to be yet another building that's going to change the character of that area quite a bit. And, and we, we said we compared it, Matt, to Hamburg quite a bit that you know well because of the projects that you did there, the Marco Polo Tower and the Unilever building. And we pointed out the big difference is that in Hamburg, the state was king again, uh, you know, making sure it got the land when it was at the lowest point cost wise. And then they were in charge and they played this as a, as a, as a you know, as an, as an argument. I have to say this one here is unfortunately state land too. And it's not unfortunate that there's state land we use for housing. That's very fortunate. But I start out in saying it's unfortunate to see what's been dumped on there again, because there's a tradition in Germany, uh, Matt, which you know so well, because your company, the founders come from it. That's called Soziala Wohnungsbau. Mm -hmm. And maybe we want to talk about that a little bit. Yeah, I mean, um, basically, Social housing, if you, if you want to just call it that, doesn't have anywhere near the kind of stigma, I think, that it does in, in the state. It's really actually, you know, very often solidly middle class housing um, of a very high quality, actually, uh, but, but, but t typically rather dense and, um, uh, uh, you know, you know not, not, not what you would consider the American dream kind of housing, right? This, your own land and your, your picket fence and all of that, but uh, very well accepted and respected as a mode of living um, in Germany. Yeah, and, and, and we know this here from who feeds us with his newsletter, just timing wise perfect, just before the show, this is Senator <clears throat> Stanley Chang, and he did again, and I already sent you, but I think he didn't give us time or I didn't give you time. The last article he wants to share with us talks about that one has to go vertical and one can't stay. And this is why social housing is predominantly vertical, which we call stacked lanai here. Mm -hmm. And it tries its best under the circumstances to be affordable, yes, but it also tries to be people friendly and not just planet friendly, which you guys try very well, as we will continue to talk about and explain in details how. Not let me why. let me interject a question here, which I want to ask both of you because I am not clear on this. One of the problems in the United States is that low income or social housing undergoes very little maintenance. And so it gets built, but then it gets trashed in a lot of cases. What's the situation with that in Germany? What is the upkeep on this housing? Mm, who of us wants to, Matt? My, I mean, go ahead and start. I mean, of course, it's probably there is no clean answer across the board. Um, but I mean, I um, go ahead. Yeah, you remember the the first <clears throat> kindergarten we did, uh, De Soto. We looked at that, and the second one are actually in in social housing areas, and there is a stigma. And even our public German clients who built the kindergartens were saying, "Oh, we got to make this. We got to secure this. We got to fence it in." We got to have anti-graffiti, you know, facades and all that stuff. But as we know from the two projects, and as you know, you know, Matt, as you do it all the time, if you make the people integral to your gestalt and not keep them out, then they will not be, uh, you know, mad at what you create. They will mm. like it, and they will. And so, I in, in both cases, you know. I know from these neighborhoods very well, there is uh, there is tension, yes, because sometimes you create ghettos and wherever you make a ghetto, if it's a ghetto of just poor people or even rich people in the Kaka'ako you're talking about, we're creating a ghetto here, but a ghetto of rich people, it never works. So the, if there is one problem is the mono structure of it, that you throw only the same people in it, but that's about it. Mm. Otherwise, you know, and, and, and sometimes the people then, you know, feel like they're ousted and not integrated. And then they, they express that, but that's the most you get. Otherwise, you know, it's, I, I, I hear you DeSoto because who is next to this one here is Stanford Carr. And we were looking into which you actually see show quoted at the bottom right at this building that wears the Kamehameha helmet on at the roof to cover up the AC. 
um there's like he was saying you know i can't make social housing that is easy breezy and we're like give us a break mm -hmm. we're we're who says that and why do you say that and so there's a lot of these excuses right and social housing is one oh it's going to be high maintenance no from our experience where not necessarily where it comes from but where it's you know done a lot this is not a reason uh, for for excusing yourself and saying sorry we can't do this i think that's you know i'm i'm just mm -hmm. gonna say i think i mean i think also you know there's this argument that um that you know if you if you build if you build environments for people that make them feel like they're inmates or they're animals they'll probably behave that way as well right and kind like it's a kind of a sort of a uh, what do you call that? A vicious circle, right? Of, of self-fulfilling prophecy, of, of right? feedback, right? Whereas if you actually create some amenities and some things that people feel valued and kind of nourished in the in the place, they actually begin to take. I mean, what you notice in at least what I've noticed in the kind of developments I've visited in Germany is that they're quite well cared for by the residents, right? They put plants yeah, in front yeah. of their doors and they hang things outside their doors on the walls and they take you know they take a lot of pride in the public yeah. parts of the building and you and, know and they do this here as well our our most favorite social senior housing we talked about it not the one that you looked in for your in-laws <laughs> which scared the shit out of us but is the senior <laughs> social housing at the beginning of Capilani uh, boulevard by frank slavsky that's exactly you know the single loaded corridor or easy breezy and they're deep enough so they can make their little front yards but in, in in the sibling of this one i'm already sort of prejudging it at the bottom right and not only is it adjacent to but it also looks like uh, we got pretty depressed when we toured it down there there's the trapped you know artificial daylight lowest ceiling you can think of that goes allowed you know acoustical ceiling crap and 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 carpet and then Stanford carpets these plaques to almost sarcastically have everyone know how this place looked like before he they trashed it and then you know <laughs> look at the size of that of that single wall unit AC that that Kili who was then going on and proposing the alternative of his uh, coconut solid timber for housing because it freaked them out you know, so the young generation gets increasingly really shocked by by this stuff and I was I was quizzing our youngest semi and I said, you know, um, how does this sort of look to you? And we started to talk about styles and hairstyles and something that <laughs> continues to be en vogue is the undercut, which none of the three of us can wear, <laughs> but the young ones can, you know, all, we can say all we have is undercut, <laughs> you know. <laughs> But here we identified this in our ongoing show. This is the second from Top Ride show quote in Chicago here where these Mesian glass high rises that he would turn around in his grave because they don't have the elegance and delicacy that his have. And all of a sudden they start to like carve out something. And that's like the undercut part of that, which this one here seems to like wanting to mimic as well as another fashion. But come on, we're not, Halloween is over, right? We're not putting costumes on anymore. Why don't you design this from inside out? And rather than throwing the green on, which we might still hope this might be vegetated, but probably not because talking maintenance, the way it looks, how would this work? And it's edible green? No, design this from the inside out. And you met, and we get to the next slide soon, but you said, you know, if we're making the reference to Obama, we should talk about his, um, I, I, sorry, Magnum PI, we should talk about his red <laughs> Ferrari, which we will. That made me think about, okay, um, this is referring to our ongoing show to Soto about mobile and immobilia which is the car that i can think of and i i want to quiz everyone and you please pay attention um about the invasion of toyota camrys or corollas <laughs> the other day i was i was walking you know i parked close to school because i was short on time and i and then paid attention to the part to the cars parked and they were like i swear you 80 percent corollas and camrys that are never basically uh, pictured because they are so nondescript. And I did my homework. I found the first, this to the top left is the first ever from the 80s Camry. And, you know, everything was designed more essentialist and cleaner in the in the 80s, although that might be our age, Matt, and got becoming nostalgic. 
but it certainly even then was not a car that was made to like okay i wow you you know potential <laughs> buyer it was like okay i'm gonna make you feel safe right because i'm gonna be a car that doesn't break down so i think what do you guys think isn't this like the camry architecture but it's sort of false because the cameras might actually make people feel safe and actually make them safe and don't burden them of high maintenance costs but we hear these buildings do like the second from bottom uh show quote here this k kali whatever you know people had to move out again it's like you buy a a, a, a camry or a corolla and then all of a sudden you have to drive go to the shop and get it fixed every day that's like cheating right you would then not ever build although in all, so fair, here, in all fairness that's precisely what you have to do with your ferrari so <laughs> yeah 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 <laughs> But I think it gets to the next slide because we might be done with this one here until we know more. So here we are with a Ferrari. But, uh, you know, you know, Matt, right? If you buy a Ferrari and you you even fetishize, maybe it's, you know, that your, that your mechanic needs to see it so often. <laughs> like you, when you like to see the hairdresser. I mean, I've known people who get crazy about it and fetishize. And maybe this is just jealousy and you know, because we don't have this anymore, but actually not because I need to see the hairdresser myself, which is me every morning. <laughs> keep that short. But let's talk about, uh, again, the, this reference between, and maybe it's not about the exclusive in here, because I want to point out that just to remind everyone, uh, Magnum was not the rich guy who owned that Ferrari. But he basically almost like stole it every now and then from Robin Master, <laughs> who was the owner of that estate, who lived in the big mansion. And he was the sort of bum that was really interesting, depicted uh, by uh, the first time on TV, what I heard that uh, Vietnam veterans were not uh, depicted as the uh, post-traumatic sort mm -hmm. of bums uh, victims, but as someone who is constantly <clears throat> struggling with that, but is trying to process that. And ironically, uh, they when they, me as a kid, I soaked this up, I watched it on TV, but not that hardcore stuff because they censored and there wasn't any on any dictatorship at government anymore that we had been before. And, you know, this was supposedly democracy, but they thought we Germans aren't smart enough to or not tough enough to handle that and they censored out some of that part and not until it came back on private tv they basically did the whole did the whole story so he was uh and then where he lived this is interesting too he lived in the guest house that obama for whatever reason kept which is the gatehouse next to the fence the wooden fence we showed last week and for the longest time we had suggested you know I think the only way he can still uh, sort of look into the neighbor's faces is when he lets some of the suburban nomads live in there, which then comes full circle <laughs> to the script of the TV show. But uh, recently we've been thinking further and thinking about something else where he might want to move, right? So that is within a Ted Paul studio, which is Bundet and Janice's office into their holy lofts, which is not far away from where he grew up in, which we show quote at the, at the top right. So that's where we are now. So, you know, I don't know if Obama listens and hears us, but if he listens uh, to us, he probably thinks we're crazy. He should, you know, leave his <laughs> paradisal, idyllic, single family residence out there in the countryside to move back in the city. But that's actually what people should do. Yes, sorry to say. Or I'm happy to say, I'm actually not sorry. <laughs> well, the, uh, the downside of that is if you move back into the city, you have to have a place for your car. And that is actually a very important point of new development, some of which are intentionally not including places to park cars with the idea that the inhabitants will either walk or use public transportation or maybe use a two-wheeled vehicle. So your Ferrari is not going to be easily accommodated necessarily in some of the new buildings that are intentionally leaving cars out. Yeah. That's a very big development in any American uh, development of any kind. Yeah, and our mid-century modern master run was sending us an article to that regards. That yes, to, that yes, yes. Read. 
One little nitpicky thing, but actually important, while our RPI mobile is convertible by nature, and uh, you made, made another suggestion because you are a very responsible owner of electric cars only, right? <laughs> yes, correct. And you said, you know, if not in Hawaii, where would we want that, right? Because mm. we got the sun out all the time and we don't drive much. So why don't we have more electric cars? And I'm biased from our easy breezy uh, mobile. Uh, uh, mobile. Um, uh, I basically, we have to say that the Ferraris and I, you know, it's, it's hard to get the graphics right and the information right at the same time, but you see the one, the 308, the original one from the 80s is a T-top. So it has Targa tops, so mm -hmm. you can easy breezy it. And in all fairness, I have to correct. I thought um, the one of the reboot is not, but it actually is different than the picture. So they wow. stayed in that tradition. And uh, because we haven't said it, but we have to say it, why is Bundet and Janice building in there? Because actually that show quote from last week, guys, go back and watch it. They were filming an episode of Magnum PI, the reboot in that building. So oh, really? come on, there's well, a tradition. Yeah, yes, yeah, yeah. There that's is. why the picture of the interior is one man punching another man. It's not that the people who live there are violent. <laughs> it's a fictional depiction going on in the building. Okay. okay. So and he drives, so and then again, and then the circle. reboot, the reboot, they drive the four, the four eighty or whatever that is on the. On yes. The, uh, yes. Okay. Yes. That's it. That's it. Exactly. Yeah, I wondered where that came from. And it all comes from that, and it all comes from Magnum and the Ferraris, and so again. We're just telling Obama, you know, until he doesn't want to hear it anymore, as if you wanted to begin with, you know, this is the tradition. So your tradition out there isn't anymore. You can just, you know, sell it or have your other buddies yeah. live in there and you go back to the to the roots. Airbnb. Anyways, so the, uh, yeah, 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 even better. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so urban. And again, um, back to the first, I mean, not back, but remembering the the one that we're not excited about on the first, which again, we said before, and we have to say, on, you know, as long as we see these, they could, although not should be with you in Boston or with me back in Germany, because climatically they would work. Not that they would make people over there happier in there, but at least climatically they were. So we will continue now to have you, Matt, as a great expert showing us how one should actually do it in the tempered. And that gets us back to your Gensheim building. Next slide. And not and, and not before also show quoting and reminding us what we were so close to, but I guess none of us made the connection that where we used state recently in the uh, Kaimana Beach Hotel is a typologi typo typologically similar beach mm -hmm. because it's a courtyard mm -hmm. type. Mm -hmm. albeit, so we go with albeit an outdoor courtyard, which uh, exactly. which actually works very, very well when you open the doors and the, the ventilation. Um, happens here. I mean, at, at Genzyme, it actually is also <clears throat> a naturally ventilated environment. You can open the flaps in the roof and in the interior windows from the offices uh, so that you get some air movement through the atrium, which then spins uh, a kind of a prismatic chandelier that's inside of it, which is reflecting light down from the top from the heliostats that are in the roof. Uh, and then the air movement from the bottom of the atrium up sort of makes that whole thing sort of move and animates the light inside the, the space. So the whole idea here is that if you're going to build a building with such a broad floor plate, you need to kind of find a way to introduce natural phenomena in there to make it livable for people. And we see this very well in the next slide, if you want to go there. Uh, exactly. Although once again, you, you explained to us who did the beautiful initial party sketches martin Birminghausen. so again these were from martin as well the previous one. right right sure. exactly exactly but, but this really illustrates puts images to the words which you just explained to and us. and i want to just point out something that's relevant for me and matt when you just visited recently bishop museum hawaiian hall which we went into and looked at is the exact same design as this which goes back to the 19th century and as i said at the time, this was a design used for both museums and department stores. At that time, before there was electric lighting, they lighted these interiors with skylights and windows on the side. And that is how you were able to view either the merchandise or the museum artifacts 
on the mezzanine floors that surrounded that open atrium. So this is actually a very old design, which you're using again. And I'm happy that I'm able to see that uh, making reference to a building that I know very well here at Bishop Museum. We, we call that such thing an archetype, right? Mm -hmm. Something that's been around forever. <laughs> right. There's a big difference. And you very you took your time to explain to us that, you know, Bishop Museum used to be open as well until you guys closed it, but for a good reason, because books and artifacts are different than people because they need to be kept away. While you met here, did all the efforts to uh, basically people-friendly this here, this type, which we know a lot from like John Portman's hotels. He's the like the inventor mm -hmm. and the protagonist of the courtyard hotel, right? But very few of them uh, are basically, you know, bring nature in in such an abundant way. Exactly. And I think the other key element of that is, um, you know, the, the sort of the Portman examples and a lot of the kind of like 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 commercial or bank examples of atria, they're almost always completely conditioned, right? Fully cooled and heated throughout the year. And in, in that sort of scenario, they become extremely wasteful. Um, this particular one is, is only very lightly conditioned during the most extreme parts of the year. Most of the year, the windows can be opened, you get natural ventilation in there. And it's actually kind of a relief to come out of an office and, and into this larger volume of space that's sort of treated like a like an indoor outdoors yeah yeah and you get the stack effect the natural effect that hot air rises up and you're right in the <clears throat> in the generic atrium hotel you've got that closed glass roof which is really counterproductive right so right. and energy intensive yeah absolutely so believe it or not, we're already at the end and we want to know what these heliostats are. So uh, you will show us in detail next week. That's how we will start out. Well, we likely, we already know, and we're doing this intentionally. You figured this out by now. We drag you in for our architectural criticism on the island. So then um, you know, we squeeze out your project like you know the most you can. But we really appreciate your... Yeah, it, both uh, you know internal and external, um, you know joining us on this because the Soto and I, speaking for myself, feel like we get so blind. No, excited. glad to do it. Over almost three hundred. Good, show, good, right? good. So next good. next week I'll have to be from I'll be in Detroit when we do this. So, all right, even better. <laughs> Report from there. Cool. I'm sort of the field correspondent now, right? Yeah. Yes, you, you are. are. Yes, you are. <laughs> yes, you are. Whether you want it to be or not, you are. <laughs> Thanks for that. Okay, see you then all for that next week. And until then, stay easy breezy, breezily easy. <laughs> bye bye. Aloha. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.